The Lord be with you. Good to see you today, uh, after we had a couple of refreshing rains this week. Um, yesterday morning, 30 college students, and then, and also some parents from the um, daycare were here to uh, do some work on our, on our playground. They also um, <coughs> put in a rain garden paid for by the Stormwater Committee of the Ozarks with a big Irby grant. Our, um, but both our text from the Old Testament from the, the book of Jonah and our gospel text talk about uh, the wideness of God's mercy and sometimes we don't like that. It doesn't seem fair. So our theme is it's not fair. Let's prepare our hearts for worship through the brief order of confession and forgiveness. Please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the sovereign over all the earth, the wisdom from on high, our merciful judge and savior. Let us boldly approach the throne of grace, trusting in God's mercy and love. Generous and faithful God, we confess, confess to you all the ways, known, known and unknown, that we that reject we and undermine your steadfast love. love. Though you made us your people, we treat strangers with suspicion. Though you forgave our debts, we collect without mercy. Yet bear quick to pass judgment on others. Have mercy on us, O God, and remember your promise to us. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Through the living word, Jesus Christ, God forgives your every debt, your every sin, and gives you a new heart and a new spirit. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Share God's peace by greeting those around you.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Almighty and eternal God, you show perpetual loving kindness to us, your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
A reading from Jonah. When God saw what the people of Nivea did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nivea, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Philippians. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy and faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or, in, or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one man, mind for the faith of the gospel. 
and are in no way intimidated by your opponent. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of be believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. The word of the Lord. according to St. Matthew, the 20th chapter. Jesus said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again, about noon, and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyards said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one you have made them equal to us who have bore the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The Reverend Dr. Delmer Clinton shares the story of a conversation with his plumber. He had a plumbing problem and a, he was thankful that this plumber came and they were discussing things and the plumber found out he was a pastor so the plumber told him about his church. And then the plumber asks the question. He's, he even asked, can I ask you a question? And of course, Dalmer said, you may. And he said, uh, this Hitler fellow, if he made a confession of faith, repented and made a confession of faith before he died, would he be in heaven? Of course, Delmer Clinton didn't want to answer the question because he knew there had to be some agenda behind it. But nonetheless, he said, well, that's what God's grace is about. That's what we preach. If he repented and made a confession of faith, yes, he'd go to heaven. And that's when the, the plumber turned red, started 
shouting some plumber words and said, that's just what you preachers are all about. You're just not fair. The guy killed millions and he goes to heaven. That's not fair. Well, this parable shows us that in God's kingdom, it's about mercy. It's about grace. It's not about fairness. In case you haven't realized it yet, life is not fair. But in God's kingdom, with God's mercy and grace, it's not about fa fairness. Oh, by the way, they are still finding Nazi criminals. In fact, they just indicted one, a 93-year-old man, Albert Goring, in um, Germany, who for decades had been talking about his experience in World War II and at Auschwitz, the uh, concentration camp. He never was involved directly into uh, any of the, the killings. All he did was he was sort of a clerk, counted the belongings that were left uh, by the prisoners, and he also counted the money in the camp. So they made, the accusation is that he was complicit in the deaths of 300,000 people. <clears throat> Should he be shown mercy or not? We'll find out. This text, this, this parable, tells us two, two things. Actually, it tells us a lot of things, but we're only going to look at two. God doesn't measure grace. God doesn't measure divine grace as a reward for goodness. It's not a reward for goodness. Secondly, those of us who think we're good enough to receive God's grace are the ones that get the most upset when God actually shows grace to someone. We object to God's love and generosity. Let's look at the first one. God doesn't measure divine grace as a reward for goodness. If you look at this gospel text, we could look at the book of Jonah and it uh, gets to the end where Jonah, we find out why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. He did not want God's word to come to the Ninevites. He did not want God's mercy to come to them. He wanted them to destroy, destroy it, and he gets in a big argument with God. I knew if I came and preached a five-word sermon, in 40 days you will be destroyed because of your wickedness, and the whole town repents. In this gospel text, it starts out simple enough. Grape harvest is on. The laborers wait at the market, sort of like... Uh, the laborers would be waiting at manpower, ready for an employer to come by and hire them. First, six in the morning gets a bunch. Nine in the morning gets a bunch. Noon, all the way up to one hour before closing time, he brings new people in. That's just fine. The landowner needed laborers. But when the paycheck comes... Everyone is treated the same. And those that worked all day long object. Well, it's not about goodness. It's about God's mercy. Some scholars look at this. And what did the laborers receive? They received a denarius, which is, which is enough, only enough, for a family, a peasant family in Jesus' day to survive. It isn't even enough for everyone to have a full stomach. It's just enough to survive. So the ones that only worked an hour, they still needed enough to survive. So the landowner just gave them enough to survive. It's just that those that worked all day long 
expected, give me more. I worked longer than they did. Ruel Howe tells uh, a story. Uh, well, God's answer to all this is, life is not fair. God would say to us, I am not fair. I am God. I do what is best, not what is fair and not whether or not any of my children think it's fair. I do what is best. So it, it's grace, it isn't fair. Rural Howe tells the story, oh, he wrote this book 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago. But he tells of, um, of a Chinese Christian artist who was going to paint a picture of, uh, of the parable of the prodigal son. And when he painted the picture, he, he showed the father uh, who had walked out to the fence around their house and was just leaning over the fence a little bit, and there the son was coming down the road, off in the distance. And a missionary came by and he said, well, it's a nice painting, but it's all wrong. And he said, why? He said, you, you just have the father standing there at the fence. In the parable, the father went running to meet his son. And the artist said, no Chinese father would do that. And the missionary said, that's the point. No earthly father would do that. But God would do that. So the artist got busy and he painted another painting. This time the father was running and he left in such a hurry he had two different colored shoes on. That's what God's grace is about. It's not based on a reward. It's based on God's mercy giving us what is enough. Let's look at this point about people not accepting what, uh, what we want to accept. Not accepting God's grace. I don't remember what my next slide is. Uh, the whole point of our second point is those that think we're good enough to receive God's grace object to God's generosity. Uh, and, and it's a little bit like this cartoon. Ted says, every time I read this story, it's unfair all over again. The reply is, the reign of God isn't fair, it's merciful. Is that supposed to make me feel better? It, it all depends on, whatever, on whether you need mercy or not. Those that think it's fair are those that think they need mercy. Ron Rollheiser is a Roman Catholic priest. And when he talks to priests and he tells the story, uh, Ron Rollheiser is actually a professor. And when he, a Roman Catholic priest who is a professor, and he says when he talks to other Roman Catholic priests about this text to show what a scandal it is, he said, just imagine, you have given up so much. You have remained celibate and faithful. And just think, when you die and you get to heaven, what would you feel like if the first person you ran into was Hugh Hefner. Those of you that don't know, and I would appreciate it, it would really be nice if somebody didn't know, Hugh Hefner was the founder of Playboy. But he said, and they are all going, I object, we've lived faithful celibate lives. 
And this playboy that tries to fulfill every single one of his urges could make it to heaven. That's the scandal of God's grace. We sometimes object and shame on us. We should not. At the 7 o'clock Bible study on Sunday, I told a story that I had told you a number of years ago. And after I told the story, I asked, anybody remember this? Not a one remembered it. And I said, oh no, I should have saved it so I could use it on Sunday. And they go, no, 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 use it. Just don't tell anybody else this week. <laughs> so I'm going to share the story. And if you remember it, good, thank you. Uh, in my last congregation, a young woman came to worship, holding a baby, newborn. And the first time she was in worship, and she said, when she left, and we shook hands, she said, this is the first time I've been in church for 10 years. I said, oh, wow. I said, uh, I hope you left your address and contact information. I'd like to come by and talk to you. So I came to, uh, over to her home and talked to her a little bit, and she... Uh, told me how she was raised Lutheran. And I said, okay, why did you stop coming to church? And she said, when I was in college, I was taking an evening course. And as I was leaving that course, I was brutally, sexually assaulted. It was terrible. My assailant, she said, was captured tried, convicted, put into prison. And she said, my husband and I went through hell trying to get over it, to get, find some healing in all this. And then she said, and, and I said, well, why couldn't you go to church? And she said, because all I could think of was that some preacher was going to go to that prison and talk to that evil, wicked man who assaulted me and share with him the gospel and he would believe and then I'd have to face him in heaven for eternity. I did not want that. I could not stand the thought of that and if I went to church, that's all I could think of. So for 10 years, she did not go to church and then I asked, well, what changed? Why now come to church? And she said, I went to Precious Moments in Carthage, Missouri. Do you know of it? And I said, yes, I do know of it. And she said, there I saw a painting on the wall that showed one of those big-headed little people holding a... Uh, a Raggedy Ann doll with a tear coming down its cheek. And there was a Bible verse under it from the book of Revelation. It was the image of heaven. And it said, And I, Almighty God, and I will wipe, there will be no more pain and I will wipe away every tear from your eyes. And she said, it was just like God spoke to me at that moment. And I realized it isn't going to matter. When I get to heaven, it isn't going to matter. God can share his grace freely with anyone. It isn't going to matter. Well, God wants us to have generous hearts when it comes to his grace. We have been accused, the church has been accused. Thomas Halleck, a Czech writer, suggests 
su suggest that one of the things that's driving people away from church is that they look at us and see us as embittered moralizers. We're doing it right. All those others are doing it wrong. Rather than being gracious and welcoming. I'm thankful that I don't have to earn God's grace. Amen. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. We believe in God, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and ascended to the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Church, the communion of With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church those in need, and all of God's creation. Generous God, you claim us as your own, and your church declares your greatness. Help all who serve you, all of us your people, celebrate your generous grace. Hear us, O God. Gracious God, people of all nations, sing aloud of your righteousness. Incite us to commit acts of peace and stand up to intolerance. May peace come in Guinea, where fear and trust 
in the wake of the Ebola outbreak led residents to beat and kill a delegation of health workers and journalists. May peace come in Pakistan where a Muslim's, Muslim scholar who had been working for justice was shot dead. May peace come in Syria, in Iraq, in Ukraine, and elsewhere where bloodshed, dominion, and terror hold sway. May your peace come. Hear us, O oh God. God, our healer, transform pain into purpose, sorrow into courage, fear into generosity, and loneliness into compassion. Send your healing to Alton Burnell, Linda Demery, Zach Drake, Wilbur Dykeman, Samir Godfrey, Jim Lampy, Elaine Mitchell, Wayne Myers, Paul Olin, Gina Rutan, Katie Snaff, Mary Thomas, and Ramona Vaughn. Are there any others? God, you are so generous with your gifts, your grace and your gifts. We are thankful for rain that refreshes the earth. We are thankful for the 30 college students and daycare parents who worked on our playground. We are thankful for the lives of your saints, which are evidence of your salvation. Comfort those who mourn, especially the family and friends of Gail Davidson, Francis Hoffman, and Jim Bolgert. Lord, in your, uh, hear us, O oh God. Bless this congregation as we labor in your vineyard, O oh God, that we may be fruitful. Help us to celebrate your mercy and live faithfully in your loving presence. Hear us, O God. Trusting in your mercy and goodness, we bring before you these prayers and whatever else you see that we need. In the name of the one who sets us free, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Merciful God, merciful God,
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You reveal your glory as the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, equal in majesty, undivided in splendor, one Lord, one God, ever to be adored eternal, in your eternal glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Also after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, Our Father who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, done on earth as, as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread. bread. Forgive, forgive us our, our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. us. Lead us Lead not into temptation, temptation, but deliver us from evil. evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All is ready. Our Lord invites us. Please come. You may be seated. Take and eat the body of Christ. Take and drink the blood of Christ.
The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. O oh God, the host at every meal, at this table you spread out a feast for all people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Send us from this banquet to invite others into these good things, to let justice roll down like waters and to care for the least of our sisters and brothers, through Jesus Christ, our sovereign and our savior. I'm going to invite you to be seated, and I'm going to invite Leslie Snyder to come forward. Leslie is moving to Florida. So we're going to send her off with a farewell and Godspeed. I think. <laughs> Maybe we should just lay a cornerstone instead. So we've got your mind set. You're going to Florida. Leaving Wednesday. Leaving? Kira, her daughter, is already there, enrolled in high school, and um, I start my new job Monday the 29th. So you're going to start a job very rapidly, <coughs> and Louise is going down for a week or so? Uh, probably not right now. Oh, okay. Third more now. In about a month, okay. We are sorry to see you go. Remember that in holy baptism our Lord Jesus Christ received you and made you a member of his church. When you came to Messiah Lutheran Church, we rejoice to receive you and your fellowship in the gospel. In this community of faith, you have heard the proclamation of God's word, which reveals his loving purpose for you and all creation. You have been nourished at Christ's holy table and are called to be witnesses to the gospel. God has blessed you in this fellowship and he has blessed us through you. We encourage you to continue to receive and share God's gifts in whatever congregation you join down there. And, and in, in that way, continue to be a worker with us in God's kingdom. Let us pray. In fact, I'm going to have you kneel. Eternal God, we thank you for Leslie and for our life together in this congregation and community. And as she has been a blessing to us, so now send her forth to be a blessing to others through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Farewell and Godspeed. <laughs> and now you may be seated unless you want to give a speech. Notice a new piece of art in the Fellowship Hall. 
If you want a greater explanation of that, it will come in the newsletter. Uh, read your spirit. Uh, also, the announcement about the book signing that's going to be at April Gepkin's house that happens to be April's mother who wrote the book. So um, you might find that an interesting thing to go to. Please rise and receive the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the grace that sustains every breath we take, the love of God that gives us courage and strength, and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit that fills our hearts with comfort and peace be with you and all those you care about now and forever. Amen. Guided by the gospel, we must worship. Make the sacrifice of our ministry, nurture youth, gather resources for growing ministries, offer healing care along the way. Make the sacrifice. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.